Thank you. We can start. Warm welcome to online analysis here. This is a postgraduate teaching program on Zoom platform sponsored by Abdullah and hosted by A1 Logist and simultaneously aired by Anastasia TV. Today we are having two eminent scholars in our sessions of orthopedic anesthesia. The first topic is hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and its anesthetic management by Dr. R. Venila. She is a consultant anesthesiologist of Apollo Women's Hospital, Chennai. She has completed FRCA in 2006. She has undergone postgraduate anesthesia training in University of Liverpool, UK and worked in UK for 11 years. She has published many articles in the reputed journals like Anesthesia, BJA, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. She was invited for contribution in many academic forums like e-learning of the RCOA and DAS Society and Entry Difficult Airway Management that is ADAM Course Manual. And she has attended more than 25 conferences as invited faculty. We are pleased to have you in our online anesthesia, madam. Over to you, madam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edward, sir. It's indeed a great uh, pleasure and honor to be on this platform. And uh, thank you for providing uh, with this uh, opportunity. Without much ado, I would uh, go mm -hmm. ahead the topic, which is a very interesting topic. I think the more we uh, learn about it over the last uh, few decades, I think the more we are trying to uh, understand this uh, complex physiology. So I'm going to share the screen. Yes. Thank to be on this platform and uh, thank you for providing. Am I audible? Yes, but I are audible. The screen is also visible. Screen is visible. Okay. So uh, today's topic for the first hour is about hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, I'm Dr. Vanilla and I'm a consultant anesthetist in uh, Obzin Gyne predominantly over the last five years. And I have seen that in the last 21 years that I've started learning anesthesia and practicing that this hypertensive disorders as a spectrum has actually got more and more complex with the lifestyle diseases that we see in our obstetric group of population. This is an interesting article by the Preeclampsia Foundation, the picture that I have put. It says, ask your doctor or midwife about preeclampsia. This is for the patient leaflet. And you wonder how much actually the staff themselves and all the staff around us understand when a lady with headache and blood pressure walks in through the door. So it's important that we understand so we can spread this information to others as well. So the next few minutes, we're going to talk about the incidence, the classification of the disease, clinical picture and diagnostic criteria, pathophysiology, control of hypertension, anesthetic implications, and management. So as we just uh, started talking about it, the incidence in overall the world is about 5 to 8%. However, in India and Southeast Asia, it's been increasing over the last few decades, about 6 to 10% of all the pregnancies. It's considered the second leading cause of maternal mortality, the first one being postpartum hemorrhage. It's also one of the most common cause of hospital admission during pregnancy due to various uh, symptoms. And the incidence has been increasing due to the advancing age at uh, first pregnancy, cardiovascular comorbidities that many of them come with, as well as the lifestyle and very, very importantly, obesity. There is a strong relationship between obesity and the vasoactive phenomenon associated in uh, a lot of these uh, vascular diseases. And it's important that we spread this message. So how are we going to classify this? There's been many classifications over the years. What you read in a classical textbook 10 years ago does not apply right now. So we have a very uh, distinct uh, difference between what happened before to now. So we have an entity called the chronic hypertension in whom these are the women who've had hypertension before 20 weeks of pregnancy. Then come the gestational who are the transient hypertension of pregnancy. Then the preeclampsia, which is hypertension plus one or more dysfunction organ dysfunction was superimposed on the chronic hypertension. 
Then the syndrome of preeclampsia, which may or may not progress to eclampsia. This part of the postpartum hypertension is not included in many of the classical definitions, but I would like you to understand that this exists and this is also there up to three months after, may exist up to three months after. So this is the wide spectrum of uh, definitions and classifications and the slight discrepancy across the continents. And hence, I think we should take up what is uh, applicable to us and we follow either the ACOG or the uh, RCOG definition. So as I said, when a lady comes through to the clinic where on a regular basis, she should have vitals measured. And if there is a persistent high blood pressure greater than 140 over 90 at four to six hours apart measured in her own circumstance, as well as in the clinic, which is not quite uh, hypertension, then we would classify her as a patient with hypertension. If it happens before 20 weeks of gestation, then it's called as a chronic hypertension. So she's probably had a tendency to develop hypertension and henceforth, it's a chronic hypertension. Then is the gestational, which happens uh, after 20 weeks. Preeclampsia is now classically defined as gestational hypertension plus evidence of one end organ dysfunction with or without proteinuria. So I think this is the most important difference in the last few years. Proteinuria defined as greater than 0.3 grams over 24 hours up to 3 grams over 24 hours or a urine protein creatinine ratio greater than 0.3. So proteinuria, if present, yes, it defines that there is a leaky uh, glomerular membrane. But if not, you, can, you should still be looking for other end organ function like uh, renal dysfunction by creatinine greater than 1 milligram per deciliter or oliguria, which could be like uh, less than 400 ml, liver dysfunction with raised liver enzymes and upper quadrant pain, cardiac with breathlessness or chest pain or arrhythmias coming in with problems. Neurological, I think this is one thing uh, that we should be very, very wary about and not ignore when a woman comes in with uh, altered behavior, sudden onset headache, you know, uh, when there is a, a loss of vision or, a, you know, uh, visual disturbances, stroke or clonus in the more severe forms and the eclampsia, where we define them as when they come in with seizures. Hematological complications are the HELP syndrome. This again would be a life-threatening emergency if not dealt with early. H stands for hemolysis, E elevated liver enzymes and LP stands for low platelets. And HELP syndrome is one of the uh, complications of severe preeclampsia. Utero placental dysfunction is another end organ where we are thinking of how is the baby behaving while the mother is having all these vasoactive changes. So which is monitored by an Doppler. So if there is an abnormal Doppler flow, an increased resistance to flow and the growth of the baby is not appropriate, then it would suggest that there is a chronic placental ischemia. So this is how the definitions of uh, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are defined now. So eclampsia is when the preeclamptic mother ends up having convulsions, you call them as having eclampsia. So as I said before, the diagnostic criteria has evolved over the five decades. So amongst the many, many uh, guidelines that are available to us, I would just stick to on the top is the ACOG, in middle is the WHO and the NICE guideline. So this was an article which was published in 2020 and they had still persisted to say that you would have the threshold to start blood pressure treatment after 160 over 105 and uh, it varied. However, now after the 2022 CHAP study results, we have gone up to say that the threshold to treatment would begin at 140 over 90. So you're not going to, your target blood pressure would be to keep the systolic below 140 and the diastolic less than 90. And this goes in common with the NICE guidelines of the UK and the RCOG guidelines as well. And your aim is not to overshoot the target, continue the treatment unless it drops too much, like less than 110 over 70. So there's a lot of controversy about how much you can go down with the blood pressure for making sure that the utero-placental flow and the autoregulatory curve for the mother actually works well. So the challenges of actually accepting a woman to have uh, uh, these chain, you know, measuring blood pressure, is she having edema, is she having hypertension, it's all masked by the physiology. So that's one. And two, the hesitation for them to come. They usually accept nausea, vomiting as a common thing. They might just say the lady is tired and not come in. So those are the common things that we have in problems in picking up early. 
so that's one thing we have to try and educate the mothers from pregnancy. And two, preeclampsia can be present without proteinuria or sometimes even without elevated blood pressure. I think this is the atypical preeclampsia. We're beginning to see more in definitely in the city areas. I'm not sure how it is in the rural. So always have an inclination to check all the systems because this is not just about blood pressure. This is a systemic disorder. It is a syndrome. So henceforth, this picture typically fits into uh, what pregnancy-related hypertensive disorders are. All we see outside, or all we have learned so far is only the tip of the iceberg, raised blood pressure, IUGR, proteinuria, a little bit of edema here and there, progressing higher up. But what lies underneath is a huge problem where there is a huge amount of vasoactive catecholamines. There could be well cardiac myopathy, like left ventricular failure or left ventricular enlargement. Uh, most important organs, your kidney and liver could be failing and you might have a, a problem with them. And worse than worse, there could be an imminent cardiac failure, neurological hemorrhage or an IUD in terms of the outcome from the baby's side. So this is an interesting article that you can actually look up to, which says analyzing preeclampsia is the tip of the iceberg represented by women, because these women, more we observe them, we're seeing that they're developing long term cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis and inflammation. So, yes, this is an interesting phenomenon to study about. So why is this so complex? Yes. So we have a pathophysiology of uh, preeclampsia that um, uh, interesting theories about them. Primarily, it's a vascular phenomenon where there is vasoconstriction. There are a lot of vasoactive amines. So first theory that we talk about here is how the glomerular cells are actually affected. There's an endotheliosis of the glomerular cells, which actually reduces the normal uh, change that should happen in pregnancy, which is increase in the renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate, both of which does not happen. And also there is a suppressed plasma renin activity. Henceforth, you have a high blood pressure, decreased GFR and development of edema. So as a consequence, you have an overfilled vasoconstricted circuit rather than a true hypovolemia and underfilling. So ideally pregnancy, it, it actually defeats the whole purpose of all the physiological changes that was originally designed to happen to compensate for the pregnancy that's happening. So you in this place, it actually happens opposite. So that's the primary change. From the metabolic, I think uh, it's considered as a metabolic disease as well because there's increased insulin resistance and more and more people are tending to have or rather it could have vice versa. People with increased insulin resistance and total cholesterol have a tendency to develop preeclampsia or it could be uh, vice versa. They also have hypercoagulability of uh, pregnancy which is exaggerated. There's an imbalance between prostacyclin and thrombaxin A2. The crux of this preeclampsia, which we've thought about many years, is the abnormal placentation, which is the reason for the maternal preeclampsia syndrome. Um, so this is a picture, which is quite a nice uh, picture, where the anchoring villi, you know, that uh, go into the uh, uterine wall. So in a normal situation, as these trophoblasts actually invade, they actually prepare the spiral arteries of the uterus to actually uh, develop into a nice dilated, well-perfusing system. It, this is called as the spiral artery remodeling and it's called as a pseudovascularization because they lose their endothelial cells and they actually have a good trophoblastic system around them. Whereas in preeclampsia, this does not happen. There is a failure to pseudovascularize and it still remains as the usual spiral arteries and, it, and this actually causes a reaction where they can actually have a vasoconstriction and a chronic placental ischemia which stimulates a lot of uh, active oxygen species to be released. So there is an increase in certain chemicals. One which of late we've been studying is the circulating soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase 1. This actually neutralizes the placental growth factor and the vascular endothelial growth factor. So these are the normal factors that are produced in these regular pregnant cells where they actually allow for vasodilatation. Whereas the tyrosine kinase 1 opposes them. So there is an angiogenic imbalance. This is supposed to be the crux of the maternal preeclampsia syndrome. The fourth theory is genetic. There is a genetic tendency towards preeclampsia. As a complex, this could be a vascular disease and it's more of a systemic disease. Uh, 
And we also tend to learn about the autoimmune theory, where the endothelial dysfunction is due to the circulating complexes. These complexes are formed because of intolerance to the fetal and placental antigens that the mother has developed. So there is a defective cooperation between the uterine natural killer cells and the fetal HLA. So normally the uterine natural killer cells, when it sees a fetal antigen, it should uh, understand that this is your own and not actually react. Instead, if there is a defective cooperation, they will lead on to forming autoimmune complexes and that will release more uh, mediators, which actually works against the growth of the baby. So this picture actually puts all of this information together. On your left on the pink side is the maternal pathway. You have all the high risk factors. First is your hypertension, pre-existing hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, obese mothers. Okay. Then you have the demographic reasons why that would the age, race, family history. Then obstetric reasons of multifetal gestation, uh, artificial, nulliparous women or the primary who are uh, elderly primary, they tend to have. Then you have the genetic, immune, and biological phenomenon. All of this contributing to hemodynamic, metabolic, and hormonal pregnancy adaptations. And these are altered in this situation. Yeah. So first, we're going to talk about the renin-angiotensin stimulation, where there is more uh, um, every vasogenic uh, transmitters which are released. There is an imbalance of angiogenesis, as we mentioned about before. There is... Um, that's one. This leads on to what we call as the senescence of the placenta. The placenta actually begins to have senescence, which is a cell cycle arrest. And instead of going in the normal pathway, it actually ends up being very pro-inflammatory and anti-angiogenic. And this is not helped by the other autoimmune phenomenon. So uh, this picture is actually quite self-explanatory by itself. And it puts all the information that we thought about the theories in one. So I think in it, it is about how the placenta itself actually begins to have a pro-inflammatory state. So based on these theories, what the current uh, research suggests us is that we actually look at early markers, have a risk prediction model and have early markers that can actually pick up these mothers in uh, the early onset of second trimester. So we can see if we can modify how the next 20 weeks go. So we have a productive outcome for the mother and the baby and prevent long-term cardiovascular effects on the mother as well. So one is considered as the podo I think podocytes um, start, podocytoidia actually starts happening before the actual proteinuria because the Bowman's capsule and the glomerular epithelial cells are destroyed because of the vasoactive phenomenon and they start losing this. Like in any other, like children with nephrotic, children with glomerular kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, this, this is a test that's actually done in predominantly in the nephrology department. So they have identified that this is actually a good marker to actually identify because if we pick this up before the proteinuria begins, we might be able to rectify the issue or at least stall uh, the problems that can happen. The other inflammatory mediators that are studied, as I mentioned, are the transmitters we mentioned, the soluble endoglin, soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase, the uterine natural killer cells, and a platelet growth factor. I think UK is beginning to do them at the for the high-risk mothers to check the platelet, uh, placental growth factor levels. And the podocyturia, I think there's a lot of research across the world, but it's something to think about how we can actually pick the markers early so we can actually prevent the problems. So once this pro-inflammatory, pro-coagulatory set, begins, we have a multi-system disorder that actually commences on. So primarily, this is the one, the kidneys are what we have always thought that is the primary organ that's affected with because it's the higher the blood flow, that organ gets affected. So you have a glomerular endotheliosis that I mentioned about, then the proteinuria, podocyturia, which might predate it, and an acute, which can progress to chronic kidney injury or acute kidney injury in the worst case scenario. These mothers can progress to have a CKD as well. Placental circulation is compromised. You can multiple placental infarcts contributing to uh, IUGR babies, small for gestational age babies. And this can actually be transmitted intergenerational. I think because there is a genetic component to every 
thing that's happening. This is sad to say that the more Ayurveda babies you see, the more that the future generation is going to be having this very nasty problem. Placental abruption would be one thing. When a mother comes with placental abruption, you've got to be very wary. Even though she comes in low blood pressure, this is somebody who can develop preeclampsia or is already in eclampsia. Uh, and it is a severe problem if she comes in severe abruption with either impending stillbirth or an IUD or a baby which could be compromised. That those are the mothers you've got to tackle very carefully in the hemorrhagic state. Cardiac MI, uh, they could have a peripartum cardiomyopathy. Sudden coronary artery disruption is something that they've uh, been reported on. These women can progress to have coronary artery disease, heart failure, chronic arrhythmias because of the electrolyte imbalances that happen. Neurologically, typically what we had been described is the women who come up with headache, visual changes, uh, have a cerebral edema and they can actually have neuro, uh, electrolyte abnormalities as well. This, when they are very severe with a sudden, sudden thunder clapping headache, you might think of that they are having a quite a significant encephalopathy. They may actually have a hemorrhage if we don't control the blood pressure. And if they're presenting with stroke, then that's quite uh, significant. Uh, they can progress on to have long-term stroke or vascular dementia, which is quite uh, sad considering its pregnancy is supposed to be a happy situation. Hypertension by itself uh, can cause problems. And when it comes to blood vessels and uh, blood cells, can have thrombocytopenia, activated uh, coagulation, help, and DIC. The other important thing is there is an imbalance between procoagulant and anticoagulant activity, and they can progress to have DIC on one side and a thrombosis on the other side. Women coming in with sagittal sinus thrombosis, cortical vein thrombosis in the, within the first seven days, within the first 12 days. Uh, we need to pick up when they come in with sudden onset headache or a neurological deficit. Impaired liver function leading on to liver infarct or hepatic rupture or a severe form of HELP syndrome would be, again, something to bear in mind if somebody comes in with acute abdominal pain or epigastric pain, uh, unexplained due to any other reason, you need to check in with a scan immediately. So, yes, we were talking about the maternal PE syndrome, uh, which is due to the trophoblastic uh, invasion. It's a late onset uh, maternal PE after 34 weeks associated with maternal vascular dysfunction prior to pregnancy. So they have a pronounced endothelial dysfunction. They are usually begin to happen as a stress phenomenon that is affecting this mother with the already compromised cardiovascular system and they have pronounced endothelial dysfunction. The early onset that happens uh, is the placental P, which is the less than 34 weeks, increased tyrosine kinase 1 PGF ratio that we mentioned before, can be quite severe and is associated with placental ischemia and IUGR. So they are the ones that we need to pick up early because this will affect the um, baby very quickly. So what are the fetal consequences? We're talking about they have a risk of IUGR, oligohydramnios, uh, more chances of preterm delivery because of the maternal consequences that they don't actually last, the pregnancy doesn't actually last. They have the risk of emergency delivery due to CTG changes, fetal hypoxia or a sudden abruption. So uh, we are looking at not so favorable fetal consequences and they need to be ideally delivered in a place where there is a neo uh, neonatal care and where these babies can be attended to immediately uh, in the appropriate manner. So how do we actually manage these women with hypertensive disorders of pregnancy? Number one is prevention, because prevention is always better than cure. And so we need to spread this information for people who are planning pregnancy. And once they start coming in for, uh, uh, you know, at booking, they need to be educated as to how to pick up and or prevent. Then the obstetric manage and our focus would be on the anesthetic management. So briefly, we'll talk about what the obstetricians have to do. And if you're involved as perioperative physicians in an obstetric hospital like I do, then you might have a role to play in how to optimize them prior to the actual delivery or C-section that they come in for. So you recognize high-risk patients. Primary prevention is very, very important. Uh, they do start aspirin at uh, 12 weeks. The do weight control, uh, adequate exercise, more of uh, positivity is very important. They start. They used to start aspirin 75 milligrams a day, but I think off late the RCOG has suggested that they increase the dose, especially for higher weight or more severe hypertension. They can increase the dose up to 150 milligram. Some of them who've had uh, you know bad obstetric history, APLA syndrome, 
or uh, they've had actually recurrent miscarriages may be on uh, clexane as well so to actually ensure that the clots don't happen so that's something that you would be looking out when you look for history and examination Continuous maternal and fetal monitoring for signs of vasoactive status, uh, in, like all the system examination, control the BP and other systemic effects. So when you then they plan to have a delivery, how long can this baby go on for depending upon the serial scans and blood tests that they have? A multidisciplinary approach, if they develop BP, do they get to see the cardiologist involved, the anesthetist early, have serial Physician referrals, if they are diabetic, uh, if they have thyroid issues, uh, then they need to see an endocrinologist because there is a metabolic component going on in the background. Only if everything goes well, the mother and the baby will be doing well. So physician referral becomes very important. So risk factors, uh, as we mentioned before in the picture from that article, uh, in maternal age, primary parity uh, occurring at a later age in pre-existing vascular renal disease, autoimmune diseases, IVF patients, APLA, diabetic, chronic hypertension, obesity, multiple pregnancies is another important uh, factor. Gap more than 10 years between the previous pregnancy and the current one. History of molar pregnancy and PCOS, all of them put them at a risk where there is an altered metabolism metabolism and a vasoactive phenomenon going on in the background. So, as we mentioned initially, the target goals for treatment, what is ideal? The current recommendation is that you lower the th treatment threshold so that you can prevent long-term cardiovascular result risks. And this is as a result of the CHAP study uh, published in recently in April 2022. But it's all the more very important that we don't overshoot the target blood pressure. We like to keep the systolic below 140 and diastolic sometime between 80 to 85. Aggressive management is needed if you are presented with a patient with a very severe crisis. You know, you don't allow for, it's not like sitting in a medical ward and allowing for the BP to take 24 hours to settle down. Uh, in this uh, occasion, pregnant women with severe crisis, it's very, very important to monitor them in a closely uh, monitored area like a HD or an ICU. Press, as I said, come with severe symptoms of hypertension and it's important to prevent neurological sequelae. Treating even the less severe hypertension, for example, somewhere between 141 to 150 is also important. Say you have a 32-weeker coming in with the 150 over 100. It's important that you treat that so that you actually can allow her to progress for the rest of the pregnancy effectively so that the baby is mature enough and the uh, mother also has a better outcome. Um, so I think this is what we mentioned. I, what I'd like you to say this here is the treatment options that are available. In severe crisis, we would be starting IV labetalol or uh, nifedipine, and the third line would be hydrolyzine, um, whereas oral drugs would be labetalol plus or minus nifedipine based on uh, uh, the blood pressure that you actually measure. So I just go on to, you have to watch for the signs and symptoms, whether it is only high blood pressure or whether there are any onset of organ failure, whether this lady warrants uh, measurement more frequently can she go home or does she need hospital? These are the three questions you need to be asking. So what are the other things that you're looking for here? Is there a sacral edema? Not just pitting pedal edema. Is there a sacral edema? Is she having edema around her back, around her body? Facial puffiness? Cardiac, is she having breathlessness? Listen to the chest, vision. Does she have scotomata? Is there any pupillary changes? Clonus is supposed to be more significant than just hyperreflexia because it can become very subjective epigastric pain, nausea or vomiting, and just an irritable patient. I once had just a lady with an altered behavior who refused to just talk properly to her own family and the family thought she was just not doing right and brought her in. And she had severe cerebral edema and pupillary changes and needed immediate management so we can actually uh, deliver her later uh, in the week. Fetal monitoring is also one of the important thing. As soon as the mother comes in and when we start treating the mother, we need to ensure the CTG is on and the Doppler flow is checked to know whether the flow is reversing or the flow is uh, progressing well. If there is a flow reversal, that's not a good sign. We might want to think as to how to plan the delivery uh, you know, sooner than later. If the facility to manage the preterm baby or the mother with the ICU or a cardiac backup is not available, you should be shifting them to a center if they are on severe crisis where neonates and mother can be managed.
So this is a beautiful article which gives a visual summary printed in uh, BMJ. On the left side, of, uh, it essentially talks about the NICE guidelines. Yeah. So on the left side, on the blue side is your hypertension pathway. So if they are only a hypertension, asymptomatic with everything else, you start them on a drug, see them weekly, and then follow them up with the blood tests. If they are severe hypertension, you might want to admit them, give the drugs, control them, and then discharge them home with the drugs. Okay. If, whereas if they are pre hypertension with the preeclampsia symptoms as well, the first time you might want to admit them, control the drugs, and then discharge home. If they are very severe hypertension, which is greater than 160 over 110, then definitely you would be admitting. So talking about the hypertension pathway, once you're treating the hypertension, you check for proteinuria, check for other signs of imminent preeclampsia. If there is no proteinuria, no clinical features, you continue monitoring and plan the birth. Okay, try to get them beyond 37 weeks if you can. If they are less than 37 weeks, then you might want to think of giving steroids for the baby. If they do develop preeclampsia symptoms, which are severe headache, problems with vision, severe pain between the ribs, vomiting, sudden swelling of the face, head or the feet, then you would want to check for your LFT, RFT and uh, uh, CBC with the platelet count or an, even a smear to check for any hemolysis to go on to the preeclampsia algorithm. So a full clinical assessment and the baby assessment. Uh, risk prediction model has been used and I think they're using it on a regular basis in the UK and some places, which essentially looks at all the risk factor criteria that we looked at. They have websites and apps where you can look at full peers model and prepes model. Uh, prepes can be used up to 34 weeks. Uh, full peers can be used at any time. It gives you an idea as to how likely is this lady. For example, yesterday I put in some features, uh, advanced age, primary paris. Uh, you know, a uh, lady with 160 over to 100 uh, on two drugs and with the uh, reverse flow and IGA, it comes up to say that, uh, you know, she has a 96% chance of having severe crisis. So, you know, act immediately. So that's the kind of prediction model that it gives. It will be worth if you go and try that. Uh, if they have such problems, you admit them and involve a senior obstetrician and uh, plan for delivery. So yes, so when such a lady is brought to you to your labor room and you're the anesthetist uh, over there, uh, you need to be thinking that yes, I know this is a lady who's coming with high blood pressure with a little bit of proteinuria, plus or minus other symptoms, all the blood tests are either normal or they're trending towards abnormal, what do I do? So the implications are it has multi-system effect, as we just said, uh, the cardiovascular, entire spectrum, cerebrovascular, renal, what's electrolytes, hematological, and the liver. So you will go about with the full history, examination system-wise to identify any issues, investigations, as we mentioned, CBC, LFT, RFT, and clotting. ECG and echo is mandatory. You need to refer uh, to a particular cardiologist as if necessary, if you're thinking that there is a problem because they have a high risk of developing uh, cardiomyopathy or regional wall motion abnormalities if there is ischemia. Neurological assessment, pupils, uh, mini mental state, uh, reflexes are very important. Uh, assess your GBP, liver tenderness, if there is any GE problems, decide on the choice of care. So if there is a good BP control, uh, you need to have a good BP control and neuroprotection is a must. Uh, if she is in labor, early epidural is advised if all BP and all the blood tests and everything is under control. If she's coming for C-section, neuraxial would be the ideal. So based on this, I'm just going to tell you why this would be the ideal plan of action. However, if she comes with a severe preeclampsia, which is severe hypertension with one of these, worsening end organ damage, acute weight gain, these are all you know red flags that should just immediately tell you. If you look at her, you should know that if she's looking very puffy, the day before she came for CTG, she was looking okay. And today she's just looking very puffy. There is something wrong. There is acute edema. Breathlessness, she can't lie flat. A woman, a mother who is unable to lie flat is quite an ominous sign, suggestive of uh, pulmonary edema. If she's a pre-existing hypertension and obese, they might well have a combination of diastolic and systolic failure. So it's very important that you actually uh, assess this uh, thing. And also, if you're going to do on the regional, she's got to lie flat. So uh, assessment of the heart and the lungs at this point is very important. Increasing cerebral irritability, visual distress disturbances, worsening coagulation, a trend between what the test was last week to what it is this morning will give you an idea. Renal shutdown, fetal CTG changes or Doppler flow changes. 
So this is uh, for a lady who comes in uh, with uh, preeclampsia. If there are severe disease features, early anesthetic consultation, liberal use of uh, point of care testing like ultrasound and echo, evidence of structural cardiac abnormality or pulmonary edema. If there is, you get a cardiologist and you plan accordingly. If there is no, you go ahead and proceed and she will need post-op critical care. If there's absence of severe diseases, you carry on with your routine obstetric management, bearing in mind but that she may progress at any point and still you would be uh, watchful over what is going to happen. So, um, this is what we mentioned. Don't overshoot the target. So how about the doses of labetalol? So labetalol, we're going to start with first line uh, IV, be 25 to 50 milligram IV bolus, followed by an infusion of 20 milligrams an hour. We have to be cautious if they are asthmatics. As soon as we start the uh, infusion, you need to know how they are going to manage. Uh, see, giving oral is one thing, but when they start IV, it can have sudden action. So you need to wear, be wary. They can cause uh, immediate cardiac dysfunction also. So you need to be uh, closely monitoring them. Next would be nifedipine. If or the first line would be nifedipine, 20 milligram stat oral, and then watch and then start an IV uh, levitol if necessary. Hydralazine uh, is another choice that some hospitals do. I personally haven't used hydralazine, but at that point, my choice would be either SNP or uh, GTN, which can be also safely used as long as they are closely monitored, which is what is suggested. The second important uh, point in the management uh, is seizure prophylaxis. We have uh, a very good evidence to say that Mac after the MACPI trial, which was published in Lancet 2002, there is a significant improvement in outcome in impending eclampsia when magnesium sulfate is used. Okay, this was a trial by 10,000 women randomized to give MacSulf as a placebo versus placebo. Uh, primary outcome was prevention of eclampsia and neonatal death, and there was a significant reduction. So the dose suggested is 4 grams IV bolus followed by 1 gram per hour continued in women with impending eclampsia. You watch for the respiratory rate, deep tendon reflexes, and the conscious level. Serum magnesium levels uh, may, may need to be monitored. Uh, toxicity levels, in, uh, if you begin to see that the respiratory rate is slowing down or the tendon reflexes are going down, you need to titrate the dose. Calcium gluconate is the antagonist. Um, when patients on max sulfate come to theta and you need to give a GA, it's okay to use succamethonium, but when you use um, non, uh, you know, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants, it might have a prolonged action and you need to have a little bit of caution about it. So role of magnesium, I think magnesium is one drug that is always an anesthetist trend on various aspects. In particular, for obstetric ward, I think it's been very, very useful to prevent all your midnight calls. It's an NMD, acts as an NMDA receptor antagonist, thereby decreasing the effect of the uh, excitatory transmitters like glutamate. And henceforth, it is actually reduces the, uh, increases the seizure threshold. So it actually acts as a calcium antagonist, thereby works as a, uh, you know, decreased cell contraction and decreased permeability causes decreased pinocytosis. So it reduces the cerebral edema. So in both ways, magnesium works as a good anticonvulsant vasodilator, calcium blocker, reduces cerebral edema. It seems to be a win-win drug to use when you have a lady with uh, impending uh, pre-eclampsia. So IV dose, as we mentioned, 4 grams in uh, loading dose and 1 gram per hour afterwards, monitor them. IM regime has all, which is a Pritchard regime, has been used, particularly if they're not closely monitored or if they see them in a peripheral hospital, they give them IM and then shift them to the tertiary referral center to us. So it's 4 grams administered in IV, 5 grams in one buttock and 5 grams in another, and then they have to be closely monitored. That's another way that some obstetricians like to do it that way. So most important thing when you're seeing a lady with a uh, hypertensive crisis or a severe hypertension is IV fluids, how important are uh, very, very crucial to manage your IV fluid management because here we are looking at a very uh, threading on a very, uh, you know, rope where if they be heavy, they are underfilled, but yet they are having a very leaky capillary. You may not have a urine output, but your IV fluid bolus is not going to bring them out there. So uh, you may have a compromised Doppler flow and people will immediately give a bolus. So you need to know who should have a bolus and who should not have a bolus. However, once they are diagnosed, you put them on a fluid restriction, one mil per kilo per hour. Usually it's somewhere between 70 to 80 mil per hour. 
not based on the lipid weight, but only on the lean body weight. Fruzamide should be used only in pulmonary edema. We say this again because uh, fruzamide will take away the even existing fluid. As we mentioned before, you have an underfilled lady with a leaking capillary. So giving fruzamide in an already compromised circulation with an already weak heart would only put the lady with a sudden uh, decompensation. So it's important to use it in an appropriate manner. Sometimes only an infusion may be appropriate to use them and not bolus doses unless they are in florid pulmonary edema. If urine output is less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour, renal support may be needed. So you may want to vasoconstrict uh, you, uh, and watch them closely and then uh, see. So yes, number four is the coagulation, which we are always very interested about. Uh, so coagulation in a preeclamptic mother or a hypertension with one organ dysfunction as in a simple preeclampsia to a very severe preeclampsia or with a, uh, you know, uh, having a complications like abruption, help or a liver failure would be a, a big spectrum that we are actually looking at. So you need to know what the numbers are. How do they actually clot? If you have any form of clotting analysis, you can do bedside bleed, uh, bleeding time, clotting time. If you have access to TEG, you can get that done. Ideally, that should be the way forward, especially in severe patients in whom you're worried that the trend is going down. You may want to transfuse platelets if less than 50 for a cesarean. If not for your spinal anesthesia, you will definitely need it for the surgery. You definitely will transfuse if uh, even if you're not going for surgery, if it's less than 20. This is what the guidelines say. Uh, DIC can be fatal. We know uh, we have done uh, when you talk about how abruption causing DIC is one of the most important reasons for mortality in postpartum hemorrhage or obstetric hemorrhage. Uh, we know that earlier you act, the better. We need to ensure that you give the right products at the right time. Um, you need to ensure that you have bedside tests, all the clotting tests. Fibrinogen levels must be maintained so that you can actually prevent catastrophic PPH. This is from the OBS1 study uh, about the PPH from the Welsh. And I suggest that you actually read about it when you read about PPH. But abruption is one important reason for uh, uh, PPH to cause mortality. Then would be the liver failure or the liver rupture, where again the clotting would be deranged. So what would you do? Would you give GA or regional? So here I would like to talk about your preeclamptic mothers who don't have abruption, who, don't, who are not on the uh, worst part of the spectrum. We are talking about the, somewhere in the early or the middle of the spectrum where you have a high blood pressure, which is just controlled. The mother needs to have a C-section and your or uh, labor and you're going to go in with a spinal or a, uh, an epidural for pain. So you have multiple studies from different parts of the world, primarily published in European and North American journals. Uh, anesthesia and analgesia. No cases of spinal hematoma have been uh, observed in hundreds of cases done with platelet count less than 100. Sorry, uh, uh, yeah. So as long as uh, they've had neuraxial anesthesia in parturians with low platelet counts. So um, 573 patients, 114 centers, no hematoma in less than 100,000. Okay, uh, neurexial anesthesia done in isolated thrombocytopenia, experienced hands, single shot, no case of hematoma when done in under 50,000. Okay, so I think this is the more most important thing, experienced hands, single shot, and the person knows what they're doing. I think that is very, very important uh, from this perspective. But ideally, if you're a junior practitioner or a trainee, they're the Bold part figure would be somewhere between 70 to 100 is a safe limit as long as the trend is not going down. Less than 70, you have to be careful. You need to discuss with the senior what you're going to be doing. So the recent uh, Astra SOAP consensus statement of last year says uh, that on the left side, we talk about the risks. Spinal hematoma with platelet count, 70 to 100 K is uh, about 0.2%. So it's very minimal. Of course, there is no procedure with no risk. I think this is what I tell my patients when they ask, what is the risk, doctor? I said, there is nothing in medical field which is without any risk. But yes, we try to minimize the risk, uh, ensuring that you are safe and the procedure is done safely. Somewhere between 50 to 70 K is 3%. So if you're 68 or 69,500, I think you need to make your judgment call based on the patient. Less than 50, it significantly increases up to 11%. So you need to have a think whether this lady needs a uh, regional or whether uh, you, you can go ahead with general. Absolute platelet count uh, can have a 3% difference 
So that's one thing. Any test you do, you need to know whether you can take it on face value or whether there could be aberrant values as well. Bleeding time, clotting time, TEG, platelet function analysis. And if platelet transfusion is nice, if there is a life-threatening hemorrhage or if there is a HEP syndrome, then you would transfuse platelets for the safety of surgery as well, not just for the anesthesia. So concern for hemostasis disorder or if the woman is in DIC, it's reasonable to avoid neuraxial. So that's a red one. You don't do neuraxial. Platelet count greater than 70 is a green. You're reasonable to go ahead with neuraxial procedure. Platelet between 50 and 70 is the yellow zone where you complete the risk benefit, weigh it and then do it. Platelet count less than 50, it's again reasonable to avoid neuraxial procedure. So this is a beautiful article uh, with a, one, a good flow chart. And I think it's one of the best ones I've seen in the last few years. It was published by the Dyer et al. in uh, Best Research Clinical Anesthesiology in 2017. So where you start with is a contraindication to regional anesthesia is decreased levels of consciousness, thrombocytopenia or active coagulopathy, as in thrombocytopenia less than 50 or an active coagulopathy, severe hemorrhage actually happening, systolic heart failure, valvular stenosis. These are absolute contraindications that you would not want to go behind her back. So give her a gentle anesthesia. You plan for a safe general anesthesia. Take informed risk consent. Ensure that uh, everything goes in the right way. Plan for the difficult airway. Obtain the BP response. Modified rapid sequence induction. Careful titration of anesthesia. If she is in heart failure, so you would treat her like any other heart failure patient. Particularly here, they can be quite fluid. They can go tip either this way or that way. So you need to be very careful. Ideally, two anesthetists. Post-op care must be in a critical care unit. If you're not having these ominous contraindications to regional anesthesia, you can prefer uh, regional anesthesia. And I think majority of our patients will fall under this. I think you might end up doing, uh, you know, very few gentle anesthesias because we usually manage them well if you're in the right place and you can go ahead with giving spinal anesthesia. Preference for vasopressors over fluid administration. This is what I mentioned. Keep them vasoconstricted and keep it flowing. Keep the heart rate going. Slow oxytocin administration because the boluses can compromise the heart. Avoid ergometrin. So I think we, we are also using a lot of carboprost. And if you are going to use carboprost, I think ideally no. Uh, if you have to, because it is a PPH for whatsoever reason, then you have to give it in a very slow manner or a small doses. Postpartum follow-up is very, very important. So, yes. So, what are the concerns about this lady? Uh, one, neuroaxial on the right side, uh, which is the green one. You, We know that when we can do. Uh, if there is worsening, you're going to go ahead with GA. Yes. So, you know that very well. But what about GA? Can it be done safely? Yes, you have all the points that you would remember for any pregnant mother uh, for giving a general anesthesia. In addition, she's also a high-risk mother because of the hypertension and the preeclampsia and the hypertensive crisis with the coagulopathy she's on. So, there are additional points to be considering as you draw your mind map. Uh, catecholamine surge during intubation and extubation. All our drugs are negatively chronotropic and uh, negatively inotropic. So they may actually suddenly drop the blood pressure, which is not very good. Uh, airway, most important, you, it has uh, may have edema. So you need to be prepared for a difficult airway. Help is always important. This is not a type of case that you would start off alone. Uh, potential pulmonary or neurological edema or even uh, hemorrhage. Uh, that is very, very important to bear in mind. And that is why informed consent is very important. The status may deteriorate at any point of time. So the most important complications that we are worried about, uh, particularly with flu therapy, is acute pulmonary edema is a leading cause of death. Getting them out, although we say that acute pulmonary edema is an easy one to treat with fluzamide, not in this group of patients. So please don't err on the wrong side. Fluid restriction is mandatory. Close watch on input output chart helps to guide your dose. And as we mentioned before, the role of LASIX is important, but sometimes they may not tolerate a bolus LASIX. It may be necessary that you can only give an infusion and slowly get the fluid out. Until then, you have to support the heart. Platelet and the lungs, obviously. Platelet transfusion may be necessary. They may have uh, additional ARDS because of that if the leaky capillaries are there. So you need to be watchful about the rate of transfusion and how uh, we are actually going to go about so these are some pictures on the left side is uh, the posterior 
reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So here it's primarily on the bilateral vasogenic edema. As you can see in these uh, pictures, you have vasogenic edema and infarcts in the posterior cerebrum. It can happen elsewhere also, but predominantly it's meant to happen in the posterior circulation. It can happen elsewhere, watershed areas, spinal as well. So uh, when the, uh, it, it's important to do the scanning. Uh, so we actually pick up uh, it can, it's not only pre delivery, it can happen post delivery, and that is very, very important. RCVS is something that can happen up to, you know, 10 days to two weeks after. I we recently had a lady who came in on day seven with uh, severe headache, nausea, vomiting, and uh, they were thinking she had a gastroenteritis, and people were giving her IV fluids. And then it's, uh, you know, we measured the blood pressure and it was high, and she went for a scan and she had a significant press. So, whereas when it comes to reversible cerebral vasopressin uh, syndrome, it is all about vasospasm. So, how the vasospasm actually causes infarcts. So, this can happen postpartum and it's important to bear this in mind when these women come in in uh, your emergency room or walk into the labor room and you're asked to assess or uh, even if they come for follow-up, uh, you know, for a seventh day review with the baby or 10th day review, it's important that they actually answer all these questions. So, they have to be followed up appropriately to prevent any disaster. Um, I think so these are the basic principles that we talked about. Uh, I think what I missed is about the airway, difficult airway, have a ramp and uh, thrive is important. A multidisciplinary team with whom you've discussed the pros and cons of every action that we're going to take is also very important. So conduct of anesthesia for cesarean, optimize and shift to OT as much as you can, avoid sudden increase or drop of blood pressure, full standard monitoring plus an invasive line may be needed. The, the need to continue mat sulfate or any antihypertensive that you have is important. You're all connected to the central lines, but then if there is a drop, then you know which to stop and the vasopressor needs to be started. Uh, maintain uh, homeostasis and be careful about the dose of oxytocin used. So postpartum, we continue with the care because you need to watch them for any cardiovascular, tachycardia, arrhythmias, any cardiac events. Is it dropping the blood pressure? Is she getting compromised with cardiomyopathy? Arterial BP is mandatory if you have a severe preeclamptic mother. Oxygen saturation and uh, crepitations in terms of uh, respiratory. Uh, what is the ABG doing? You may, it might be a very helpful way to see what's happening. Fluid balance, restrictive strategy, blood investigations as appropriate. You would at least repeat LFTs and RT every fourth hourly or sixth hourly as appropriate, depending on the clinical situation. Or you would probably do it the next day morning. CNS, APU scale and the pupils are very important. Any neurological deficit would warrant a, a CT brain for this woman. Thromboprophylaxis, again, you need to weigh the risk benefits between is she actively bleeding or is she going to be clotting? And based on that, you would actually judge when to start the thromboprophylaxis. A uh, useful tools uh, at this point of time would be uh, we need to have the skills to do focus. So I'll just come lung to know your B lines. Uh, if there's any uh, liver hematoma or echogenic findings, are they increasing? Because in the middle of the night, you won't get an ultrasonographer to come and help you. It's always important for us as uh, perio physicians and critical care doctors to understand what how to pick up uh, main important findings. Is the IBC filled? Should, does she need filling? And if so, how am I going to do it? An echo to screen for cardiomyopathy or effusions, uh, regional wall motion, abnormality. So in summary, it's a complex pathology with multi-system involvement. Um, the latest uh, thought process is that we should lower the threshold to initiate blood pressure therapy, the target being less than 140 over 90. Uh, but diagnosis need not necessarily have proteinuria or elevated blood pressure. It can only be the organ dysfunction signs. Uh, close multi-system monitoring will help us prevent life-threatening problems. And that is why obstetric muse chart in the ward, uh, it will raise the red flags for the nurses to actually call for help. I think that's very important. Otherwise, they do not put uh, things together to actually say, okay, this is an impending problem. Please come and see me. So if you empower the nurses with the OBS Muse chart so they can actually call you for help. Pre-op optimization, intra-op meticulous anesthesia management and post-op critical care with a multidisciplinary team is suitable for severe preeclamptic mothers. Um, teamwork helps and high-risk informed consent is very important. 
Uh, this is the article that's published uh, uh, recently, uh, I think early this year, Hypertension in Pregnancy, the Diagnosis, Blood Pressure Goals, a Scientific Statement from American Heart Association. It's a quite a nice article which gives a summary of all the research that's been happening before and how we have gone forward with the management. I think it would be an interesting read for you. Most of the information in this uh, presentation is taken from there. Thank you for your patient listening. Hope it was uh, useful to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Neela, madam. You have extensively covered the, all areas of the hepatitis disorders of pregnancy with a touch of uh, recent update also. So we move on to the questions. So yes, the first sir. question Thank is, you. what test you have to do for a podocytoria? Is it specific for the pre -eclampsia? Podocytoria is not uh, specific for preeclampsia. It's actually, uh, you know, uh, how the podocytes are continuously being released in the urine because of the damage of the Bowman's capsule and the glomerular membrane. So it's done in your pediatric wards for chronic kidney disease in the nephrology department. Uh, so it is a specific test uh, in terms of checking for podocytoria. I'm, I've am i just actually recently liaised with our micro lab to actually use, they use a dye and they actually check for the uh, podocytes in the urine sample. And that is what podocin is a dye that is used. So if you want it, you need to specifically ask for in the lab. I unfortunately don't know the cost because I'm just in the process of identifying how to do it in our patients, but we haven't done it so far. But uh, there are more and more, I think in the UK they are using, I'm not sure if they're using anywhere else. Okay. So the you said the steroids in the preeclampsia, will it affect the hypertension? Good question. I think it's always been a concern. It definitely affects the sugar if they have associated gestational diabetes. Uh, I think the betamethasone doses that they use... Um, I think there's enough research to say that uh, we were worried once upon a time that the steroids are going to cause and uh, there were multiple studies which said yes and, and no. But then fetal maturity, lung maturity is of paramount importance. We know that this mother has hypertension and we are going to control her with Maxelf and the drugs. We want the baby to be in the most optimal situation. So weighing the risk benefits, I think we are going to go ahead with giving steroids, the ideal dose so that the baby is at best when it comes out. So the next question is, how neuroprotection is given for preeclampsia in the preoperative and intraoperative period? Neuroprotection. Yes, I think that's what uh, we were dwelling with. The neuroprotection is first BP control because you're going to have to ensure that there is no uh, infarct or hemorrhage that is happening. So there is no, you maintain an optimal blood pressure. Max sulfate is the drug or, you know, your uh, drug, your main savior in uh, preeclamptic mothers in your labor room. We need to start uh, max sulfate as soon as you know that this is somebody with cerebral edema. Uh, some of the cues that you might have is one, high blood pressure. If not high blood pressure, they might come in with an altered behavior and your electrolytes are all over the board. Sodium might be low. They might have reduced urine output. So uh, you know that there is a, a cerebral edema, visual disturbances, scotomata, and your typical neuro features. So you would start max sulfate. That is the only mainstay of treatment for cerebral protection. So when they come for anesthesia and you're going to be giving spinal, then we are not going to uh, uh, affect the cerebral features, then we are safe. That is why we are always pro-regional. And that is why we are talking about what are the platelets and uh, you know all the other features to ensure that your uh, uh, regional technique is safe. If at all you have to give general anesthesia, then you give a neuroprotective anesthesia. Imagine there is somebody with a subarachnoid aneurysm in the brain. Imagine you're giving anesthesia to a AAA. This is like a ticking bomb sitting there. This entire mother has multiple problems in the body and that is how you're going to treat her. So one anesthetist for drug, one anesthetist for airway. That is how you should be working on this. So the max sulfate would continue. Antihypertensives will continue. You will connect a vasopressor in case you drop the blood pressure too much. That should This should be the... Dilators should be stopped and the constrictors has to be started. So you maintain optimal. Monitor the pupils, blowing up of pupils or anything you have to be watching during the general anesthesia. Uh, Dixmed etomidine can be used if you're not using poly, you know, too many drugs uh, as bolus to just keep the blood pressure optimum. 
the same principle applies throughout anesthesia and at the time of extubation as well. Uh, so you don't have sudden surges of uh, blood pressure. This is the best neuroprotection that we can give because we are not going to be able to control or uh, reduce the edema in just 10, the 40 minutes that we are doing cesarean section. And it's going to take time for that to reduce. So once the body, once the placenta is out and once the baby is out, then you have to watch how she goes. Is she improving? Is she decreasing in the critical care unit? Because they can go vice versa also. It's not like once the placenta is out, they improve. They can take time. So uh, you need to continue with the neuroprotection after. Does this answer your question? Yes, yes. So the one drug we can rely upon is the magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection and anti sure. Thank you. So the next question is, in case of BPH, the post LACS, carbidocin with 100 mics were given. Uterus is still flabby. Prostaglandin also given. So, what uh, next drug we can give? Carboprost is also given. Yeah, carboprost is also given. And uh, so, yes. So, what next drug we can go for? Well, uh, so the, the, uh, carboprost can be repeated every 15 minutes. Uh, but if you're having somebody with impending cardiomyopathy, you would be worried. At this point, I think the surgeon needs to take control. Uh, if you have given uh, two drugs and it's not responding, you can't repeat a second dose of carboprost after 15 minutes, ensuring or reassuring the mother. You might want to give her some sedation and anti-emetic if she's awake. If she's asleep, then you watch the bronchospasm and uh, any cardiovascular changes. Uh, but what is more important from the surgical side is they need to have compression sutures. They need to start uh, massaging the heart, uh, massaging the uterus. Compression sutures, I, I think I have seen work, uh, you know, beautifully. Uh, and then if compression sutures don't work, then they go on to do the b -linch. And then if both of these don't work, then it's time for uterine artery ligation. But uh, usually with the second or third dose of carbo uh, carboprost, maximum I've given is two doses, not gone ahead with giving third dose in a PIH mother. But uh, second dose after half an hour, you know, if you're still uh, struggling towards the end of the case and everything is done and they want to still keep it in, that's one. The other thing surgeons do is leave uh, intrauterine mesoprostol. Uh, they feel that it is safer. It, uh, this research does say that misoprostol is safer to use in uh, PIH mothers than more carboprost. So they put uh, four, which is 800 milligrams inside, and we uh, observe them in the recovery. See, before, if you hadn't used carbatosin, it is usually 40 minutes action. So by the end, they come to recovery, you can start into infusion. Yes. Uh, am I right, sir? Yes. yes. So we have to absorb the agent and we have to move on to the surgical management. I think. Correct. But, but the thing is, we, they need to be sure that it is contracting before you close. Otherwise, it will be uh, haywire. Yes. So, the next question is, can we use CBP for fluid management in case of preeclampsia? Yes, I think that's uh, that's uh, absolutely uh, necessary uh, in the sense we have moved away from doing unnecessary lines uh, for infection control and various reasons. But CBP monitoring, uh, if they are in pulmonary, severe preeclamptic patients with uh, cardiopulmonary compromise is necessary. Okay. So what is the ideal analgesic drug for HELP syndrome patients undergoing for LACS under GA in the post op analgesic? <laughs> I think uh, HELP syndrome patients can be quite tricky because uh, you cannot use, uh, you know, the doses of paracetamol and uh, uh, non-sterols are contraindicated. You, you have to be wary about using how much opioids you're going to use. So I think the safest, because if they are under general anesthesia in post-HELP syndrome, either under on, on ventilator or uh, off ventilator in a critical care area would be fentanyl patch would be my choice. I, I think we use extensively fentanyl patch in these high-risk patients because they are small doses and it's easy to titrate. And uh, I think it's already titrated. So that's my drug of choice. Okay. So the last question is, why hypertension incidence is less in preeclampsia after spinal anesthesia compared to the healthy woman? I think that's a question you should have asked yourself every time you've done the case, isn't it? So uh, pregnancy physiology, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, I think that's what uh, this uh, preeclampsia defeats the whole purpose of physiological changes that normally happen in a normal pregnancy where they are vasodilated, allow for beautiful blood flow to happen and the baby to grow. Here it's all vasoconstricted. So uh, the 
uh, th- there is so much sympathetic uh, sim- uh, sympathetic activity going on that your sympathetic to me doesn't really bother them at that point uh, the blood pressure is still maintained they will still drop 20 mm that you normally see but it is n- never totally gone uh, so they they still have the catecholamines uh, in circulation that i hence uh, the blood pressure is maintained but you must uh, uh, i have seen that if they are uh, hypertensives who are actually on the severe end and they also are badly diabetic insulin dependent diabetic they don't do that they do drop the blood pressure you have to be wary in them because they don't have the autonomic reflexes that happen their catecholamines work differently so you 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 can just like that cannot give a big uh, spinal dose you titrate according to the patient's uh, comorbidities can i add a few more uh... Yes, well, there is a, three reasons they are given uh, in literature. One is the IUD that is uh, associated with the preeclampsia, the uterus size is less, so the uh, hypotensive syndrome of pregnancy is less. That is the one reason they are given. And another reason is, as you said, there is the circulating catecholamines are high, various types of vasopressors are circulating and the sensitivity of the vessels to the vasopressors are also high. Mm-hmm. It does not obey the sympathetic blockade. And the third reason is the locally active vasoconstrictors and vasodilators also are not, not obeying the sympathetic blockade. So that is the de-arrangement of the vasopressors which are secreted locally in the blood vessels. So they cause vasoconstriction irrespective of the sympathetic blockade. So they, these are the three reasons given the literature. I'm yeah. happy to add that. Madam. So with that, we come to the end of this excellent uh, presentation and uh, discussion also. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. This is uh, sad news. We are deferring the second topic because uh, Sunil Pandey has to rest uh, his family because of some uh, medical emergency in his family. So the second t- topic is cancelled today. Our prayers are with uh, Sunil Pandey, sir, for a speedy recovery of his uh, family members. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the session. I thank the sponsor akula the a1 logics host and the anesthesia tv and uh, dr vinila madam also i thank and all the uh, also thank the viewers so we will meet the next week with that we will come to the end of the session shilpa madam we can close the session thank you sir thank you madam